Here's a list of five bad telescopes I secretly want. We all have our guilty pleasures. Here are some of mine. Let's get to it. There's some pretty embarrassing stuff on here. Yes, it's the Mead Starfinder 16-inch Dobsonian, the equatorial version. I had a review of the Dobsonian version, Tubby or the Widowmaker. It was this promise that you could have this big aperture scope for not spending a lot of money, and they weren't very good. And right now, they sold a lot of those things, and they're just sitting around in people's basements with the significant others begging the person, please get rid of this. But even more ridiculous than the Dobsonian version was this equatorial monster that you just couldn't use. It was ridiculous. One person I know who owns one of these things says it is too 247 pounds worth of bad cardboard. And in the early versions, around 1992, there was even a version that didn't have tube rings on it. Picture the amount of stress on those bolts screwed into Sonitube. Those of you who follow me here know that I am often praising the previous generation, that is the research-grade Newtonians, which I think are not only some of the best reflectors ever made, they are also among the most beautiful, and they are gorgeous pieces of industrial design. But even the regular models, the 628, the 826, the 645, and all of their variations are very desirable as well today. There's an 826 back there, and over here, here's the model 591. That is the student version of the number 628. They went from first to worst. Do not buy Starfinder reflectors. I don't know what the equatorial versions I think are worse than the Dobsonians, but the Dobsonians are nothing to write home about. When they came out with these, I continued to buy them and I'm not really sure why. I think it was inertia. I just liked the previous version so well, I just assumed the new ones would be good. Also in the category of don't buy are the DS10 and the DS16. Those were really cheap as well. And yet, I want one of these. <laughs> It's so unwieldy and so impractical and so ridiculous, it actually takes on a kind of charm of its own. And not only that, I have a place for it. There's, there's a, a place right over here. People walk into the house. The garage is right over here, and when they come into the house, this would be the first thing that they would see. And I just want to see the look on people's faces when they go, what in the world is that thing? And I know they're also going to ask me, can we look through it? And the answer is going to be, uh, no, I'm not moving that. Yes, it's the Criterion Dynamax 8-inch schmidt cassegrain Late 1970s through mid-1980s or so. You know, it was an exciting time to be a schmidt cassegrain buyer. Celestron had always been around with the C8, and then Mead came in, just blew up the whole market with the Mead 2080, and they took off from there with all of the variants that were just better and better and better as years went on. The Criterion's just kind of hung in there because for a long time before Mead came along, it was just an alternate, someone who just didn't want a Celestron for some reason. It was just hanging around. Well, when Mead came along, things got tough for these suppliers. Now, at the time, Mead and Celestron were con constantly one up in each other. You know, every year they'd come up with a better model, things were better, things were more advanced. At the other end of the spectrum, you had two Schmidt Cassegrain manufacturers, and it was a race to the bottom. It was a race between the Bausch and Lomb's and the Dynamaxes. I'm picking the Dynamax because I think this is by far the worst of the two. This is quite probably the worst Schmidt Cassegrain ever made. Look at this, a new way to look at things. Jeez, you think it could have come up with a better, <laughs> better slogan than that? But anyway, these always these have a terrible reputation. You could sense the desperation here. They, you know, they tried to come up with a brochure that looked like the thing that Mead came out with, with all these pictures in it. But even then, you could tell this wasn't a very good product. I, I really treasure this brochure. It's from 1978. But they have a white paper. It says, Telescope Design, Fact and Fiction. And it goes on for quite a bit. And uh, it, 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 is, it is a paper. It's made out of paper. And, and it is white. And beyond that, this is awful. So the problem is that the marketing people at Dynamax had an issue. They didn't have a viable product. They knew it wasn't any good, so they had to think of something to talk about. So for the first two and a half pages of this brochure, they brag about the Bakelite tube. Then for the next page and a half, they brag about the tripod. I'm getting the impression that what I'm buying is a Bakelite tube and a tripod with some telescope optics in it. 
It's never going to look better than it does in the brochure, right? But even here, you can see it's ugly. I want one of these things. I'd like to do a review of one of these. Some of these have come along from time to time. People have offered to give them to me, but generally I run into two problems here. Either someone has left it in the basement for the past 45 years and it's just not usable anymore, or you get somebody really ambitious who has just upgraded the whole thing. I know people who have completely rebuilt the focuser. I know people who have refigured the mirrors. And now the thing, well, it's better than new. Well, that's not what I want. I'd like to see a pristine condition, one of these, in original form and test it today. Uh, I have a feeling it's going to be pretty bad, but yes, I want one of these. Next item, the Mead 4-inch Schmidt Cassegrains from the early 1980s. Most of them had numbers that began with the number 2000. Of all of the telescopes on this list, this one is the least bad. These you could at least use. But this product was unusual for at least a couple of reasons. Number one, for some reason, these weren't very good. I've never seen a good one of these, and it's really odd because it should be a lot easier to grind a 4-inch mirror than an 8-inch. It should be much, much easier, but they screwed it up somehow, and the 4s were worse than the 8s. The second reason is because this was during Mead's heyday. They, they, were, they couldn't do any wrong during this period. One of the few misfires from the 1980s. Mead found out the same thing that Celestron did. It costs almost as much to make a smaller schmidt cassegrain than it does a larger schmidt cassegrain. Your fixed costs are the same. The factory is the same cost. The factory workers are the same cost. It doesn't cost you any less to advertise a 4 or 5 inch schmidt cassegrain than an 8 inch. So by the time you add it all up, the prices just kept creeping up. And Celestron, if you notice, their C5s were almost the price of the C8s. And the 4 inch schmidt cassegrains here were almost the price of the 8 inchers. For some reason, the C5 has persevered, the 4-inch schmidt cassegrains have not. Adding to the confusion was that there were just too many models. At the low end, there were two that were 1000 series models. They were spotting scopes or they were telephoto lenses. Once you get to the 2000 series, those are the ones meant for astronomy, there were just too many of them. There were 2040, 2040A, 2045. Some of the later ones had the suffix D on them, indicating that they had a DC power supply that could work on the clock drive. You know what? I want one. The marketing, as always with Mead, very, very good. Ready to go with you at a moment's notice. Study land, sea, and sky. I can still quote these lines 40 years later. And another thing, they advertised these telescopes as things that you could just drive out to the middle of nowhere and start using. They would be these ultra-portable observatories. But until the very end, all of these were powered by AC clock drives. This was the 1980s, and they didn't have all those alternative power sources that they do now and portable power sources. So you'd get out there and you'd have to plug the thing in. So if you do collect these, I highly recommend the last model that they made, the 2045D, which operates off of a DC power supply. At least the thing is usable. And yes, I want one of these. Ah, Edmund Scientific. <laughs> Look, all Edmund Scientific telescopes were bad. All. I may be doing a video on this in the future. They were all bad. There wasn't one good one in that lousy bunch of them. If I had to single out one that might be a little bit better than the others, I'm probably going to pick the Astro Scan. That's the one you can actually use if you wanted to. These others, no, not usable. Look, Edmund Scientific was not a telescope manufacturer. They tried to act like one, but they weren't. Edmund Scientific was a dealer in used parts, and it showed. They kind of look okay in the catalog, but then when you get it home, it's like, ugh, what is this thing? You know, I told the story before, but I, for years, lusted after that 4-inch F10 red Newtonian because of that picture in the catalog. I just wanted to be those kids. They look like they're having so much fun. Now, at this point, I had already sworn that I would never buy another Edmund Scientific telescope again as long as I lived. I've gone back on that promise twice now, and I've regretted it both times. I got that 4-inch F10 thing and I couldn't believe how bad that thing was. The mount was unusable. It, it looks like an equatorial pedestal mount that you might get from Mead, but it just doesn't work. Now, the, the, there weren't even tube rings on it. There, there were these pallet straps that 
went around in this Victorian corset arrangement and the, the lock and the axes on it were just awful. No matter what you did, they were either too tight or they were too loose. And even if you tightened the thing for display, eventually it would loosen up over time and the thing would just flop over and crash to the ground. I mean, it, I don't know what I was thinking. The secondary mirror wasn't even an ellipse. It was a rectangular thing bent on a piece of metal. If you measure the thing, most of them aren't even anywhere near 45 degrees. And looking at those, I'm always wondering if there were dentists in the 1970s near Barrington, New Jersey, who were missing some of their instruments. And yet again, there's pictures of a six inch and eight inch fork mounted Newtonians on here. If you look very carefully the way they lay out this catalog, they're very careful not to show you close-ups. And there's a good reason for that because the closer you get, the worse it looks. Now, as bad as those pedestal mounts are, people I know who have those things tell me the fork mounts were even worse, which I find to be impossible because the, the, the pedestal mounts were unusable. And yet, I want one. And it's not just because I used to sit in my room and read this catalog. It's more about, wasn't the product, it was more about what it represented. I would just sit around and dream about, you know, I would take that 8-inch F5 telescope with me. And just, it was more the idea of what it would show me and what it would teach me and, you know, the, the things that we would learn together. So, yes, even after all this time, I'm probably going to go back on my word one more time. I'm probably going to get another Edmund Scientific Telescope. This one's going to take some explaining. So if you weren't around, I started scope reviews back in 1997, and my review of this telescope, that's what put me on the map. That's why people started following me. And at the time, it was novel to have a website, and I didn't really have any conception that the things that I was writing here would be read by people until one day I went to Neath in Suffern, New York, and everybody just knew everything about me. So this is weird. I mean, this is, you know, the internet was a way to communicate with other people. But this telescope was owned by my friend Mike, and it was a flagship model in Meade's lineup. And if you follow the story, the review is still up on Scope Reviews. It wasn't right. It's, it, the views were just bad, and we couldn't fix it. We couldn't get it collimated. It went back to Meade. It came back in exactly the same condition. It went back, and it just keeps going back and forth. And it became obvious to us this telescope was never going to be right. And I've since seen all of the other models in the lineup, the 4, the 5, the 6, and the 7. All of them, to varying degrees, have the same problems. I want one. I want one for a couple of reasons. Like Number one, it looks cool. You can't deny this. It just looks good. You know, I, I talked about the place over there where I'd put the 16-inch equatorial. I think the 7-inch would look very good sitting next to it. The second reason is because of just what it represents to my personal history. It's, that's what got me started, and I kind of feel like I should have one. All right, folks, there it is, a list of five bad telescopes that I secretly want. Do you have a model that's bad that you secretly want as well? Let us know in the comments below. I look forward to reading them. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.